When we last left off, St. Thomas Aquinas was determined to join the Dominican order. However, it didn't go so well with his family and his mother was not happy. Aquinas, who was maintaining communication with the Dominican order, had informed them of his family's discontent. Thus, the Dominican order stepped in. They attempted to move Aquinas to Paris via Rome. However, Aquinas' mother learned of this and arranged to have his brothers seize him and escort him back to the castle. It was here where Aquinas would be held prisoner for almost one whole year. Over time, his mother finally capitulated and arranged to have him escape so that he could join the Dominican order. Aquinas went to Paris, where he would study under the Dominican order. Other than a brief stint in Cologne, Germany, he remained in Paris, where he would earn his master's in theology. Through his education, Aquinas became so enamored with Aristotle's teachings and presentation of Stoicism that he used these aspects of Aristotle's writings to illustrate Christian theology. Aquinas did this through his work, Summa Theologica, to present the realism of God, the written works of God and Jesus, and the sacraments as presented by the church. However, another sect of the church, the Jesuits, admonished Aquinas for these works even after his death. Regardless, the church canonized Aquinas in 1323, which was cause for celebration among the Dominican defenders of Aquinas. Through the dialectics of canon law and theology, Christian Aristotelianism had become a movement known as scholasticism. 300 years later, this movement became the foundation of philosophy, knowledge, and science as presented at the Catholic Church's Council of Trent that assembled between 1545 and 1563. Its purpose was to assemble church leaders to clarify church doctrine as the Protestant Reformation continued to oppose the principles of the Catholic Church. During these councils, the works of Aquinas, as validated through the writings of Aristotle, served as applications of literal truth as presented by nature and scripture. This doctrine upheld the words of the scripture Scripture. It established that if the scripture contradicted science as observed through nature, the scripture was to be treated as an allegory and not truth. And this is where Galileo found himself at odds with the church. Galileo was a mathematician. Many of his findings combined experimentation and mathematics. For example, after Galileo was placed under house arrest, he used his time to write more scientific manuscripts. In 1638, upon completion of one of his works, Galileo arranged to have some friends smuggle this manuscript out of Italy and sent to a publisher in France. This manuscript is titled Dialogues Concerning Two New Sciences. This work provided some groundbreaking mathematical sciences because it established the mathematics behind dynamics. In fact, Galileo's belief that mathematics were the thoughts of God got him into trouble. The Inquisition accused Galileo of believing that he could think like God. In my research, I found that the historiography of the Galileo affair shows an ongoing argument of rationalism versus empiricism, Aristotelianism versus Copernicanism, Aristotelianism versus Platonism, geocentric versus heliocentric, geostatic versus geokinetics, faith versus methodologies, Dominicans versus Jesuits, and ultimately the harmony of the church versus the conflict of science. One such historian, Maurice Fino Chiaro made a marvelous effort at showing how these arguments are oversimplified, which dilutes the real reason why Galileo was tried for heresy. As a result, in my own research, I have found that through this overarching argument of conflict versus harmony, there appears to be a gap in explaining why Galileo could not effectively argue for his defense. Within that gap, 
there is another theory. Galileo's argument to the church made no sense to the Inquisition, and they could not follow his logic. This is effectively pointed out by Professor Philip Paul Weiner in his 1936 article, The Tradition Behind Galileo's Methodology. Galileo's epistemology was flawed, which led to confusion among the Inquisition. Also, within the historiography of the Galileo affair, Professor Weiner showed that Galileo's most significant mistake in his argument was presenting the argument of Plato and the mathematics of Copernicus, both of which the church opposed through the philosophies of Aristotle. By opposing Aristotle, he became a heretic of the church. But here's the thing. As a mathematician, Galileo studied Aristotle's works extensively. As a result, in his argument to the Inquisition, he attempted to distinguish between abstract and concrete concepts in physics. This can be noted where he stated forces, resistances, moments, figures may be considered either in the abstract, disassociated from matter, or in the concrete associated with matter. While his intentions were Aristotelian, the outcome of his argument supported Platonic philosophies. Thus, to my previous point, though his intentions were to support Aristotle's doctrines as translated by St. Thomas Aquinas, he ended up supporting Plato's philosophies, which were considered heretical. Or, as the historian Rivka Feldhey writes, the Galilean struggle for scientific truth was revealed as full of scientific errors as well as political rhetoric and tactical blunders. In other words, as noted before, he confused the Inquisition, which is on some level very reminiscent of many confusing discussions with large governing bodies. Thus, Galileo was placed under house arrest in 1633. While under house arrest, he published another book, Discourses Relating to Two New Sciences. In his lifetime, he published 13 written works. Some of his other works were phenomenal and contributed a great deal to the future of science. As one of the first scientists to observe the universe through a telescope, Galileo observed that the moon did not have a smooth surface. Also with his telescope, he also observed Jupiter's four largest moons. He did do a lot of work with buoyancy and possibly invented the thermoscope, which is a device that shows changes in temperature. His work with analysis of temperature and buoyancy led to two of his students, Evangelista Torricelli and Vincenzo Viviani, to design and invent the thermometer that relies on buoyancy to indicate the room's temperature, which is this. The liquid inside this tube is more than likely water and ethanol. These small glass tubes are filled with colored water and there's nothing exceptional about these little contents, but the weights in here is what creates the weight of each ball. As a result, each of these tags has a different density. When the temperature inside the tube changes, the density either increases or decreases which causes the bulbs to rise and fall depending on the temperature surrounding the tube. So, when the tube gets colder, the density will increase. When the tube gets warmer, the density will decrease. So as I remove my hand, you can see before this one was up here, this is 72 degrees and it's now falling because I'm heating up the tube with my hands because the density has decreased, the weight of the fluid surrounding the ball is being displaced. As a result, the buoyant force has decreased. It can no longer support the heavier discs, which causes the heavier discs and the ball to fall to the bottom of the thermometer. So while I could talk at great lengths about mathematics and the science of Galileo, I realized that I must bring this video to a close. 
Galileo was a brilliant man who made incredible contributions to mathematics and science. Unfortunately, the rest of his life did not play out in such a way that he would have known how much of an impact he had on the world of science. While under house arrest, Galileo began to lose his eyesight. Unfortunately, the house guards denied him the opportunity to seek proper medical help. He eventually went completely blind. Galileo passed away on January 8, 1642. Sadly, the church denied him a Christian burial, despite his devotion to Christianity and Catholicism. Furthermore, the church denied permission to erect a monument in his honor. 350 years after Galileo's death, Galileo was finally pardoned for adhering to scientific evidence that the earth was not the center of the universe. Unfortunately, we can't immerse ourselves in history to fully understand what exactly happened during the trial. Still, that does not absolve us from questioning why the Catholic Church did not pardon Galileo until October 31st, 1992. Thank you for joining me. And remember, if you are interested in watching these videos a week before they are released publicly, come on over to patreon.com slash math science history. And until next time, carpe diem.